Hello, good morning, everyone. My name is Christopher Brown, and I am the curator for the Children's Literature Research Collection at the Free Library of Philadelphia. Welcome to Grip, a poem, book, and raven with Marilyn Singer, Edwin Fotheringham, and their new book, A Raven Named Grip, how a bird inspired two famous writers, Charles Dickens and Edgar Allan Poe. Today, we're gonna to be chatting with Marilyn and Ed, and we're gonna be joined by Joe Shemtov from the Free Library's Rare Book Department. Joe is going to introduce us to works inspired by Grip, and we're also going to get a chance to meet Grip, who has resided at the Free Library of Philadelphia since the 1970s. Now, before we begin, I have a little bit of housekeeping to do. This program is co-sponsored by the Children's Literature Research Collection and the Rare Book Department. Our goal is to engage the public through free programs about the importance of primary source materials in our collections, expand the knowledge base of our patrons through research support, and foster new ideas through displays and exhibitions. If you'd like to learn more, you can visit us online at freelibrary.org slash CLRC, freelibrary.org slash RBD, and visit our online repository of programs and activities at bit.ly slash fun with FLP spec coal. And I'll add all these links into the chat once I'm out of the hot seat. We have a few upcoming and ongoing programs I'd like to mention before we begin. Although the world oceans cover more than 70% of the earth, over 80% of it remains unexplored. Learn more about this and how we can protect the marine life in the exhibition Under the Sea, now on view at Parkway Central Library until February 25th. It's been 90 years since the crisis of the Great Depression inspired a new deal of arts programs infrastructure investment, and worker protections. But it's not just history. Even today, we ask ourselves, who gets to matter in the United States? Learn more about this in For the Greatest Number, on view at Parkway Central Library until February 4th. And in February, we'll be chatting with Monica Carnese about her new book, There's a Lion in the Forest. Carnese's work has been called Skillful and Ingenious by Kirkus, and There's a Lion in the Forest has already been named a Junior Library Guild selection of 2022. Learn more about the book and Carnese's storytelling philosophy later in February. But now let's meet our guests. Marilyn Singer has written a lot, including film notes, catalogs, teacher's guides, and poetry. She has published more than 100 books for children and young adults across many genres, including realistic fiction, fantasy, mystery, poetry, and nonfiction. She received the 2011 Civil Award for, po for Poetry for her book, Mirror, Mirror. And her work has been lauded by the Washington Post, Porn Book, Booklist, and the American Library Association, among many others. Marilyn is joined by Edwin Fotheringham, who has created illustrations from everything, from album covers to magazines to books for all ages. His work has been featured in publications such as The New Yorker and Ladies Home Journal, and his illustrations have introduced children to a range of historical figures from author Mark Twain to athlete Annette Kellerman to the First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt. Welcome to you both. Marilyn, I'll turn it over to you. Oh, thanks a lot, Chris. Uh, I am delighted to be here today from uh, damp Brooklyn, New York, uh, and um, I I albeit virtually, Today I'm going to uh, read to you from A Raven Named Grip and talk a little bit about how this book came about. So I'm gonna start with the opening of the book. Charlie, Katie, and Mamie Dickens were not fond of Grip the Raven. The bird chased them around the house. She bit their ankles. She chipped off paint to eat. But the children's father adored the raven. He was Charles Dickens, the most famous writer in all of Great Britain. He'd already published four popular novels, first as installments in magazines and then as books. Even Queen Victoria was a big fan. In Victorian England, people had many pets besides cats and dogs, especially birds. Today, it is illegal to keep wild birds, but back then people caught or purchased them to keep in cages. Wealthier folks sometimes bought exotic species such as parrots or minas. Charles Dickens chose ravens. 
1841, when he was working on his next book, Barnaby Rudge, Dickens decided to make Grip a character in it. The main character was a man who wasn't very clever, but he had a pet raven that was. Dickens's descriptions of how the bird behaved were accurate and amusing. Ravens can imitate human speech and Barnaby's raven talked a lot. Dickens's raven could speak too. Her favorite expression was, hello, old girl. It was the last thing she said before she died. The lead paint chips had done her in. Charles Dickens was very sad. His children were not. During the Victorian era, it was popular to have a pet stuffed when it died. So Dickens sent the raven to a, to a taxidermist. Then he hung Grip in a glass case above his desk to keep him company while he wrote. And he got another raven, which he also named Grip. Mamie described Grip too as mischievous and impudent. Perhaps that bird was a leg biter as well. Grip two was followed by Grip three. Henry Dickens, another of Charles's 10 children said that this raven was so bold that it bullied their mastiff Turk. The bird would stride up to the large dog's bowl and Turk would back off as Grip ate the best bits of food. The raven could also crack window panes with its beak and swallow keys, then spit them back up, much to Dickens's amusement. Because he was so popular, the author received an invitation to visit America and talk about his books. His wife, Catherine, came along, but she was worried about leaving the children. To comfort her on the long journey, Charles Dickens's friend, Daniel McLeese, painted a picture of Charlie, Katie, Mamie, and the new baby, Walter. He put Grip Two in the painting as well. Catherine gave the picture a special place in every hotel room where she and Charles stayed. Before they got to Philadelphia, Dickens got a note from an American writer who wanted to meet him. The man had read Barnaby Rudge and liked it. He was amused by the Raven. He'd even written a good review in the Saturday Evening Post, a highly respected newspaper. Though in it, he said that it would have been an even better book if the Raven had croaked throughout to foretell doom. The American writer was not famous yet. His name was Edgar Allan Poe. So that is the beginning of A Raven Named Grip. Well, how did I come to write this book? Well, to tell you that, uh, let's go back in time to 1967. I was an exchange student at uh, the University of Reading in Great Britain. And uh, I was there with a group of students from Queens College, New York. Uh, when we got to London, we found out that there was a tour arranged and we were really, really, really excited. My friend Eileen and I, we're really looking forward to this tour until we found out that um, the Tower of London was not part of it. So we were very naughty and we cut out of the tour, the actual tour, and we took our own tour and we ended up at the tower. Uh, I was dazzled by the crown jewels. I was creeped out by the, uh, the block on which I think Anne Boleyn met her and the executioner's block. But what really enchanted me were the ravens. They were hopping around the lawn. They were humorous. They were obviously very, very intelligent and they were very engaging. And I got interested in these birds. So a few years later, I was back in London with my husband, Steve Aronson and our friend, Andrew Matthews. And uh, Andrew uh, may not know this yet because I don't know if he's got this copy of the book, but this book is dedicated to him and to his wife, Sheena Matthews. Uh, I love them both. And we were all at Reading University together. And I know that they're Dickens fans. I think maybe they're Poe fans as well. So anyway, back at the London Zoo. I think I headed us straight for the Raven's cage. Uh, I was wearing a purple poncho with pom-poms. And uh, I was standing there at the front of the cage and a Raven hopped over, stuck its beak through and pulled a pom-pom off my poncho and then proceeded to toss it back and forth with its mate. 
as we, well, we were watching this and we were very charmed by the whole thing. And then the birds got tired of this game. And for some reason, I knew exactly what was going to happen. I was there at the front of the cage. The raven hopped back over, stuck its beak through. I held out my hand and it put the pom pom in my palm. Well, if I wasn't in love with ravens and the whole corvid family before then, corvids are ravens, crows, chuffs, rooks, jackdaws, etc. If I wasn't in love with that whole family before then, that was it. That really did it for me. And it, and it created a lifelong interest in this whole family, corvids, to the point where I wrote a book of poems about crows and I had a pet crow, which I do not endorse. It is not legal. We didn't know that at the time. My husband and I, we were kind of ignorant. And um, so don't do that. Uh, but the, the story has a happy ending. This crow had free reign of the backyard. And uh, on my birthday, it flew away with a flock of crows. So there's more to the story, but that's for another time. So anyway, flash forward to 2019. I've been interested in this bird family for a very long time. And Steve and I went to a lecture about ravens and crows at the White Memorial Conservation Center in Connecticut. So I was familiar with quite a bit of the information because as I said, I'd read a lot about them. But then came a story that I had not heard before. And it was about Charles Dickens and his pet raven and how he put this bird as a character in the book, Barnaby Rudge and how Edgar Allan Poe Yep, there's a picture from Barnaby Rudge. Uh, one of the many, uh, there are many different illustrated versions of this. This is a happier picture. There's one of uh, poor Barnaby in prison with his uh, raven as well, but they come out okay at the end, which is also good news. Um, but anyway, so I, I didn't know that he had had ravens and I didn't know that Poe had visited him and wrote a poem sometime later, which is very famous, which most of you probably know called the raven uh, in which the raven says exactly one word nevermore more on that later so after i heard this story at this lecture i turned to my husband steve and i said wow there is a book in that so that's that's the origin of how this came about but my question and quest began well became well how do i write this thing so the first thing is research. Um, I already knew the Raven, Poe's poem, but I had never read Barnaby Rudge. So I did, uh, and you just saw a picture from it. And then I also read a book called The Raven Master uh, by Christopher Scaife. And this is a picture of the actual Raven Master with one of the Ravens. I know that he visited the, um, the Free Library of Philadelphia and gave some interesting information, which was also in his book. One of the things that I found out was that grip one was female. Everybody had been calling it he for years, but it turns out that it was a she. Um, and I also uh, found out that there's long been a grip at the Tower of London, it's a raven named Grip, but for reasons I cannot figure out and nobody's explained it, well, it's spelled with two Ps as opposed to just one. So I also found out that online, there are a lot of interesting articles that talked about this meeting between Dickens and Poe. And some of them had really delicious elaborations such as what Dickens, who was well off and, 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 and beloved, what he wore, as opposed to Poe who had no money and, and was kind of shabby, uh, shabby chic, I think we would call it, um, and would never have any money, even though his poem was a success and he went all over the country reading it, he didn't make any money from it. And that's something I think a lot of us can, I, children's writers can identify with. Uh, anyway, so these were all juicy tidbits that I could use to write this book, to put in the story. Um, there, I also found that there was no primary source that states that Poe definitely wrote The Raven after this meeting, but pretty much all Poe scholars believe that that's what happened. And I also found out from this research that Grip is at the Free Library of Philadelphia, something I didn't know beforehand. My husband and I were really hoping to come and visit her in person and then COVID hit. So we hope we will be able to do that sometime in the future, but it's exciting to see her online. So after all this research came the writing. 
Um, I read you the final opening. Uh, that was the final version, but here's how I originally opened the book. Once upon a time, the British thought it was silly and irresponsible to keep pets. But in the 1800s, things changed. People began to believe that owning pets made children and adults more caring and responsible. Dogs and cats were popular, of course. So were rabbits and more exotic animals, such as monkeys and many kinds of birds sold by merchants or captured by their owners. Rich folks could import wild parrots and minas. The less wealthy could catch blackbirds, thrushes, robins, and other birds to keep in a cage. And then there were ravens, incredibly intelligent, able to talk, and fond of getting into trouble. Today, it is illegal to keep wild birds as pets. But back then, so you can see that I use some of that information to open the book. But my brilliant editor, Lori Hornick, and I think she may be watching, so she is. Hi, Lori. She said, well, that's interesting, but it's long and unnecessary. And I realized that what I really had to do was tell a story. So as I said, there were some juicy tidbits that I could include, but how to grab readers immediately? Well, that was, that was the question. And then it came to me, this is a children's book. So I need to start with children. And in this case, Dickens's children. And there was a lot of information about their feelings about, <laughs> about grip one uh, and grip two. Uh, they were not particularly fond of them. There were actual quotes by them. Um, I think Mamie, Mamie had written memoirs. Um, and here is a pic the actual picture of four of the children, he ended up with 10, um, and, and grip two. So I wanted to make sure that these children appeared through the course of the story. That was pretty easy with uh, Dickens's children because they traveled with the painting. And they had, as I said, feelings about the other grips. And I could, if I didn't have the exact quote, I could mention some of them as a probability based on other quotes. But could I somehow feature children in Poe's story as well? So then I came across this amazing morsel, and it, this is how I put it in the book. Children would follow him in the street, flapping and croaking until the poet would spin around and say, nevermore. Then the children would run off squealing. Well, that was too perfect. So into the book it went. And to wrap it all up, I had the readers picture grip one in the library, a place frequented by children. And here's how I end the whole book. Today, anyone who visits the library can see the raven who inspired two of the world's best known authors. If you close your eyes, you can picture her chasing Charlie, Katie and Mamie around the room and biting their ankles while their famous father dreamed up his next book. And you can imagine another group of children flapping and croaking behind a poor and talented poet, then scattering like a flock of birds when he whirled around and spoke the magic word, nevermore. So that is how I came to write this book, but it wasn't a book yet. It needed to become truly magical and it needed illustrations. And we got the amazing, brilliant Ed Fotheringham, and I love his illustrations. I'm I am so thrilled with what he did, and he's going to talk to you next about he, how he came to illustrate the book. Hi, um, I'm Ed Fotheringham, and I illustrated A Raven Named Grip, happily. Um, very glad to have gotten the manuscript. Um, and so as an illustrator, um, I receive what is an edited manuscript uh, close to final and and I feel like my job is to sort of create the box in which this thing lives in which these words live so I'm, I'm trying to create a sort of visual package um, and for for this manuscript I saw a few things happening I saw um, a sense of time and place there are several locations that this takes place in there's London, Boston, Philadelphia, um, all in the Victorian era, mid 1800s. Um, so that was going to speak to how I researched my, my, my drawings. 
Um, also, the raven. Um, I didn't know. I mean, I know about crows. I'm in Seattle, Washington. We have a lot of crows around <laughs> and seagulls. And, um, you know, crows and ravens are from the same family. And, and crows are mischievous birds. And everything I read about ravens is they were also mischievous birds. And so um, if you notice in the book, I'm just going to pull up a page here. I don't actually have a screenshot of it, but I'm just going to show you this. And you'll notice that um, I just thought about this as Marilyn was talking about the mischievous ravens. And I realized that I intently put grins on every single raven in the book. And I don't think ravens can grin, but you know what? That's artistic license. I wanted them to look mischievous. <laughs> so that is based on, um, well, the reality that they are mischievous birds. And um, I'm gonna show you um, some of the process I go through researching for the drawings I make for, well, many books, but this one in particular. Um, so just allow me to share my screen. Okay, um, hopefully everyone can see that. Um, okay, so this is one of the first spreads and you'll see that, you know, this is an interior from uh, Charles Dickens study. And this comes from like real stuff that I found on the web. Um, I'm gonna also show you sketches that um, I did beforehand. So from this final art, um, this is the sketch that goes to this. Um, and this sketch was derived from things that I found, uh, pictures of the interior of Dickens' study. So you'll see the desk there, the window, the bookcase. And this is looking at it from the other side. So, you know, I'm pulling from, from real material, but then adding figuration in there and a, a bird jumping around and tapping the beak on, on the uh, windowsill to add, you know, some flavor to it, some whimsy. Um, but so I, I sort of couple reality with whimsical sort of figuration and things that people do. Um, and then moving on, this is about the place part. So Dickens was in London, Victorian London. Um, and this is a, a London street scene. Uh, this also comes from reality. Um, whether the bird was jumping up and down, um, actually nipping at the, the heels of, of Dickens' daughter, I'm not sure. They say that that happened, but I wanted to sort of amplify that. Uh, but the background is from reality. Um, this is the sketch that I made for this drawing. Um, so the reality is this. This is that building that they are walking by. It is the Charles Dickens Museum, which is in his old home in London. Um, you'll see like the ironwork, the doors, the windows, all based on this photograph. And then this is the, the this is, I believe, grip one um, after being stuffed by a taxidermist, which Dickens had done. Uh, and then back to the art. You'll see I've drawn that, that thing right there, the box. Uh, this is uh, Boston uh, after uh, a, what apparently was a brutal trip on the RMS Britannia, which is a steamship. Um, although I didn't show the brutality of that trip, apparently it was quite rough, the crossing. Um, anyhow, in the manuscript, there is a lot of mention of this painting um, that, that uh, Dickens' wife I think demanded that they travel with because they couldn't bring their children on this trip. So this painting traveled with them, hung in every hotel that they stayed in on this trip to the United States. Um, also, Dickens was a star at this point. Uh, 
I believe he had published Oliver Twist at this juncture and people revered him. So I, I show that in the crowd scene. Um, again, a sort of whimsical sort of view of that, but showing popularity. And then a sense of the Bostonian uh, skyline of the time as well. Um, so the ship though, and the picture are both based on, on research. Um, Here's again, the sketch for that drawing, just so you know that, well, I sketch before I go to final. Um, and then this is the actual RMS Britannia. Uh, so if you look at the, the rear end of the ship and then go to my sketch, you'll see that I base it on that. Um, so again, I'm, I'm, I'm using sort of real things from research, but then coupling it with a whimsical sense of character. Um, and then this is the painting as Marilyn showed before. Um, and my, my version of the painting is similar, slightly different, a little more stylized, but the elements are all there. Um, and then this is in Philadelphia. And this is the point at which Edgar Allan Poe uh, curls around and says nevermore and much to the children's delight. Um, so the buildings in the background, uh, this being Philadelphia are based on this, which is uh, Edgar Allan Poe's home in Philadelphia. Um, if I go back, you'll see a similar architectural style based on that time in Philadelphia. But again, with, you know, with the, the whimsy of the character bringing fun to it, a raven flying in the background, but then the architecture is based on, on actual uh, time and place. And then uh, London and Philadelphia. And this is, this is an illustration uh, portraying the, the trip that the, the, the the bird made after, uh, I believe his name was Gimble, who was a big fan of Dickens and a, a wealthy individual that owned department stores in the United States, bought the taxidermied bird, brought it to Philadelphia and gave it, I believe the story is gave it to the Philadelphia Free Library, which is where it resides now. Uh, so this is, showing that trip from London to Philadelphia. Um, so for Philadelphia, because it's referring to the library, my illustration is of the library. Um, here's a sketch and here is the library. And so I just basically travel via the internet to all these places <laughs> to get this information and uh, it's really fun to do that. Um, just a moment, I am going to stop the share of my screen and come back to you now. Uh, okay, that's it. Um, I hope that was interesting. That's how I go through my process, um, sketching, researching, and then bringing fun to it. And it's, it's a blast, honestly, I love, books based on different places, either in the United States or internationally. I love traveling in my mind and drawing pictures for that sort of stuff really allows you to do that, it's super fun. And now I'm gonna hand it over. Great, Marilyn, Ed, thank you so much. I'm going to introduce uh, our colleague, Joe Shemtov in the Rare Book Department, who is here with our very special guest star and Corvid of the of the hour. All yours, Joe. Thank you, Chris. Um, so I have learned so much in this presentation alone. So thank you so much. It's a joy to uh, to hear your stories and how how the book was made. So my name is Joe. I'm my librarian uh, in the rare book department, and right next to me is Greg. Uh, that is Charles Dickens's bird. There were multiple grips, this is one of them, and the only one that survives. And what we see here is the modern cage on the outside. 
And the inside of this so-called modern cage is Charles Dickens's cage. It was his cage. And they say that Dickens even arranged the foliage in the cage itself. So um, Charles Dickens was very, very um, distraught when his pet bird died. And we know that from a letter that he wrote to a friend of his named Daniel McLeese, which exists. And um, he wrote, he will be greatly shocked and grieved to hear that Raven is no more. He was extremely attached to this pet and uh, so much so that when it died, he, uh, he sent it to uh, the local taxidermist, uh, had it stuffed, brought it back home and Grip continued being his pet bird in the home in that cage. So of all the things that we have in the rare book department in Philadelphia, and we have a lot of things for a lot of scholars and a lot of people, the one thing that gets the most draw is this stuffed bird, Greg, that belonged to Charles Dickens. And um, it's more than just a stuffed bird. So uh, as we all know, Charles Dickens was a social activist and whether it's through Marilyn's and Ed's book, it's an introduction to Dickens. So we can talk about his love for birds, his humanity, and how that translates to other issues and social issues. And so we had a group, there's gonna be a group, maybe they're here today, uh, from Ch Chester School. Uh, the students had never heard of Charles Dickens, but they were enamored with the bird itself, which still survives. So until today, we are telling stories about Dickens and about what was important to Dickens and how Dickens changed society. And we use this bird as a platform to tell that story. So uh, one thing I will note before we pass on, before I go to uh, Edgar Allan Poe, um, is that in the letter, he says he wasn't sure how, uh, Dickens wasn't sure how uh, Grip died. So we tell the story that it died from eating lead paint, but in the letter to his friend, um, uh, Daniel McLeese, he says, I'm not wholly free from suspicions of poison. A malicious butcher has been heard to say that he would do for him. Uh, his plea was that he would not be molested in taking orders down the muse by any bird that wore a tail and so forth. So, you know, the mystery continues as to exactly how the bird uh, died. So I'm gonna mosey on down to another thing I'm gonna show you, hold on. Thanks so much, Joe. We learned so much about this. And Marilyn, Ed, we have a historical mystery that is just crying mm -hmm. out for uh, a follow-up of Grip 2, the Grippening, and, and what happened <laughs> to, uh, to, to the bird. Was it, was it murder, was it not? Uh, <laughs> We're going to switch over again to Joe, who is uh, traveling through the department. He's going to show us some more artifacts now that uh, okay, are available. Thanks, Chris. So in a way, um, um, Barnaby Rudge, and it's not in a way, it is. Barnaby Rudge is not Dickens' most popular book. In fact, it's a dry book. Uh, but in that book, which is a historical novel, uh, 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 partly about the Gordon riots, way back, uh, that is the book that features Grip. So Grip, his pet bird, was the inspiration for that character of Grip. So, but, but the popularity of this bird, Grip, is because of Edgar Allan Poe. So I'm gonna show you a couple of things right now. So here it is. So we saw the bird. And now we see the actual poem of the Raven. So we have it at the Free Library. And it's the... It's the only extant complete copy of the Raven in existence. It's the most um, popular and iconic poem, American poem in existence. And what it is, is it's, I think we call it a bifolium, which is it's one piece of paper. So it's four pages. One, two, three, four, five, six, 
two, three, four. And uh, here he signs the poem and uh, he signs it and he uh, addresses it to his friend, uh, Mr. Whitaker, uh, who lives in Phoenixville, which is uh, not too far away, or it's in, I think it's in Pennsylvania, not too far from Philadelphia. So, and of course you see nevermore at the end, uh, the last word written by Poe himself. So this is it, this is the artifact. Uh, this is the inspiration. We have it, we show school children this document, we show professors, scholars, and then I'm gonna show you something else. I'm probably gonna, before we mosey on down, just show you the first paragraph before we go on. The famous paragraph that um, until today, we have people coming in who have memorized this because they were forced to uh, in school. So in high school, and they know it. Sometimes they know the whole poem. Sometimes they know part of the poem. But the fact is that Poe was, uh, he, he was living in Philadelphia uh, in the 1840s and he reviewed Charles Dickens's book, Barnaby Rudge. And the thing that really caught his eye, the thing that really impressed him was the Raven, uh, Grip, the Raven, uh, the character. And he thought uh, that that more could have been done, that, that the croakings might have been prophetically heard in the course of the drama. So he thought that Dickens could have capitalized on something that he did not. And that's the um, birth, the, um, the, the, the impetus, the inspiration for Charles, for uh, uh, Edgar Allan Poe's uh, writing of The Raven. He ran with it, he saw an opportunity and he ran with it. And in a way it's prophetic because uh, Marilyn's book and Ed's book is, is building on that character of the Raven. Uh, so it's the continuation, the baton has been passed. I wanna show you something else. So, It's kind of a weird reflection, but here you go. Boop. It's a little crooked, but that's okay. This is called the Ultima, and I'm mispronouncing it. I, I blame it on the fact that I'm Canadian, so I, I mispronounce things all the time. Uh, the Ultima Thule Daguerreotype. Uh, so Daguerreotype as a technology um, precedes photography as we know it. It didn't last very long. But it, as, it, within that kind of format, um, this is one of the most iconic images, even within, within that um, format. And that is Poe's, the picture that we have of Poe. And I wanted to say something about it. When it was taken, and a lot has been written about it, it was taken um, a year after his wife died. It was taken um four days um it was taken four days before he tried to commit suicide okay it was not a happy time in his life and it was taken um at, and, and was given to his um so-called fiance uh who rejected him and months after it was taken uh he died Okay, he died. And there's a whole bunch of uh, theories as to why he died. So it's, it's uh, kind of sad, but it's interesting. Imagine if the one picture that you had of yourself defines you and defines how people perceive you. A horrible picture, a picture that you don't want to be represented by, but somehow it becomes the iconic you. It could be the worst, like my bed head. I wake up in the morning. Someone just told me that somebody died and that picture will define you. And that's kind of what happened to Poe. So that picture kind of defines him in a way. And then you have that, um, that um, uh, obituary by his so-called friend Griswold, which maligned him as well. 
The other thing I will say before I, um, I finish is that um, that Poe was very much aware of daguerreotype as a technology when he was writing. And so there's a lot of scholarship that has been written about how it impacted his writing, um, daguerreotype, photography. And you can point to a difference in that type of, in his writing. So it, it, when we talk to students, um, we talk about that and hopefully that's gonna inspire a future scholar that they are gonna be taught, that, hey, I wanna talk, I wanna learn about that. Like, did it impact Poe's handwriting? He, he, he knew it. Um, and so um, I wanted to share those, uh, those things with you. And anyone can come and visit the Rare Book Department. We are open Monday through Friday right now, COVID uh, hours, Monday through Friday from nine to five. You can come see the bird and you can make an appointment to see the daguerreotype and make an appointment to see uh, the raven, the poem. But the bird is on display all the time for anybody to see, nine to five, no appointment necessary, just come on by. Joe, thank you so much. You've given us a lot to, to think about and to, to learn about. I've added links into the chat for the general public so they can also view the, the manuscript and the daguerreotype online if they if they want to. I will recommend that. It's always fun to come in and look at things in person. Um, we've also learned a lot from Marilyn and Ed about the creation of the book. I want to share a little bit of gossip uh, uh, about, about this, which is on Tuesday when we had a practice session, you both met for the first time. And uh, for the folks who are watching at home or watching later, can you talk about this process? Is this a common practice for you as an author and an illustrator not to meet? Um, I'll start if you don't mind. Um, my understanding is that it is common for us to not meet in the process of making the book. Every author I've met, um, that I've worked with or worked on their manuscripts, um, I haven't met until after the thing is published. And it's usually in situations like this, actually, like, um, you know, school talks or library talks or something like that. But we, we, don't, we don't work together uh, in the process of making the actual book. Um, I work with an editor. I work with an art director. Um, Marilyn would work with the same editor. The editor is the person that is like the glue that binds. And my understanding is that that's done on purpose so that the two processes, I mean, we, you know, we, we have different, we have different expertise. And I guess, I mean, it makes sense. Like they, you know, we should just go about our business the way we do, see how it comes out. The editor has sort of a clear vision without being married to the work because the editor didn't produce the work. So the editor can see things clearly, um, make good calls, make rational judgments. <laughs> because when you're working on something, rationality just goes away. Believe me, it's hard to, uh, it's hard to have a critical mind. And so, yeah, I, we, we don't meet. And so, I think, and it, I think there's a reason for it because it's it's hard to um, you need that person in the middle. Uh, what what do you think, Marilyn? Is that oh. Marilyn? You're muted. I unmuted myself. Okay, there we go. Um, I think that uh, they don't want us stepping on each other's toes. That's one of the things. But I want to add something, and that is, um, it it used to be for me many, many years ago that I was not even given a chance to say whether or not I liked the uh, this person as the illustrator of the book. In other words, there was no choice. I used to, used to be like, this is who's illustrating your book. Either things have changed or I've been in this business so long now that I have some say that people actually, uh, editors do say, what do you think of this uh, illustrator? And sometimes I've actually said, uh, I don't think so. And they've been, then they present somebody else. 
in your case, Ed, as soon as I'm not kidding you, as soon as I saw your work, I went, yes, because we needed that element of whimsy. You know, this is a, not a just a strictly factual book. Other books, you know, it's it may be different, you know, uh, but that <laughs> so that's part of the process, too. Do you like this person? Yes. Do you like this person? You know, but really, it used to be like, this is who's illustrating your book. And that can be difficult um, in terms of meeting, doing it. I, I can I that's fine. You know, I think I'll do my work. You do your work. But I really do like meeting afterwards. And I, I think that that's actually kind of important because then you can share stories and share process and and it's fun. So I have gotten to meet quite a few illustrators at this point afterwards. And sometimes it's events like this. So we do signings together or uh, even occasionally conferences, which has really been fun also. And there's some I've just never met at all. And, you know, sometimes they don't, they live, you know, internationally and that's, and that's hard, you know? So, uh, yeah. So I agree with what you're saying, basically. That's wonderful. I'll mention to the people watching uh, right now live that if you want to ask a question as well, there is a Q&A button down uh, below at the bottom of your bar. Please feel free to write in. Uh, we have one, which is Marilyn, your friends, Andrew and Sheena, thanking you for the dedication. <laughs> uh, it was a nice surprise. We yeah. <laughs> a lot. And uh, Marilyn, as you mentioned, you were able to look at the artwork and see different styles. But Ed, you have a lot of different styles and, and places you go. I mean, you, you do a lot of nonfiction and real people, but then you've also brought to life Tony Baloney, who's an amazing character that, that children love. Is it easier doing real people so you have the reference or do you like the joy of being able to do whatever you want? Um, ooh, that's a tough one. <laughs> it's not that tough, actually. I'll, I'll be perfectly honest. Um, I became an illustrator because I like deadlines and I like, uh, like it gives me a reason to make the work. <laughs> and, and so the reality stuff gives me something to chew on that I really appreciate. I, with, the, with things like Tony Baloney, I feel more sort of like I'm in a great big ocean of anything. And I don't, I, I just, I don't know where it's gonna go. Like, and so the, the, the more historically, the, the stuff that's, that's more non-fictional, um, I, I really do enjoy the, I love the research and I'm not, you know, I'm not like an erudite researcher. I just, like I said, I like the notion of, traveling in my own mind it's like you know i I've, i told my kids when they were growing up i'm like you need to eat different kinds of food because it's the cheapest way to travel <laughs> when you, you know you can eat all of these international cuisines in your own home in your own city it's amazing and um i feel that way about illustrating these books where they you know they take me all over the place to places i've never been and i i research I look at the place, I look at the geography of the place, I get a sense of the culture of the place. I love it, I just, I do. And, and it's, it's like the deadline thing, it just gives me a reason. And so honestly, for me, I kind of, I, I, I gotta say, I, I love the non-fictional stuff. That's great, that's a great answer. I was, I'm gonna turn the question around in a moment, Marilyn, ask you, but I see that Leslie Kay, who's watching us live, has asked me very similar. What is the difference in your writing process when you're doing poetry or pose? Is, poetry or prose, excuse me. Is one faster or easier? What's it like? Oh boy, <laughs> that's another one of those difficult questions. Um, so when I write poetry, lately I've been writing collections of poems. I mean, I, I used to write more individual poems, you know, just for fun, my own edification, whatever. Um, what happens with me is I sort of get an idea in my head of, oh, that would be an interesting topic to write poetry about. And when I, once I start that, if I've written like five poems, then I feel like I have a collection going and I become 
a mad woman in the, <laughs> and Steve, my husband will attest to this. He calls it, he goes, you're poetizing again, aren't you? It means I'm sitting there and I'm gazing off into the distance. I will write really, I will write a lot of poems really, 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 really quickly. Um, sometimes they require research, uh, depending on the, the topic, but um, sometimes they, you know, they, they don't really. Uh, so I would say that in general, uh, those are those are quicker for me, really. Doesn't mean I don't rewrite them or revise them, but um, when I'm writing prose, it, well, there's a lot of different, I mean, it can be fiction, it can be nonfiction, it can be picture books, short stories. Um, if it's nonfiction, they, that requires a lot of research. So that's going to, you know, uh, that's going to happen before I actually start writing the book. Uh, and I think that that can take a while to really shape nonfiction so that it's interesting and it's not just a bunch of, of facts. Novels, forget it. That takes, I, I don't even, there are novels that I've written that uh, there's a long gap between starting it and finishing it. So I would say that that poetry definitely goes more quickly for me. Um, and something I gravitate towards a lot. It's it's very different in that I I, I tend to get a a, a picture, uh, almost a photograph in my in my mind of something. I get an image and I will run with that. Uh, prose is very different in that regard because it's expanded on. It's not it's not a moment uh, as much a, a a poem to me is often just a moment capturing a moment or, or answering a question, whereas prose is a much longer you know, process and uh, explanation of something. I don't know if that answer, I hope, Leslie, I hope that answers your question, but. And I wanna, I wanna jump on that. Prose is such a, such a huge field. Like as you alluded to, we have novels and we have picture books, which end of the pool is harder to swim in? Is it, uh, where where do you find yourself naturally gravitating towards? In in terms of prose? In terms of prose, yeah. Well, <laughs> that's tricky too. I mean, I think they're all difficult. I think, and to be honest with you, I think nonfiction is easier to write uh, because you have the facts and you, you know, as long as I can weave them into some kind of interesting story, uh, you know, or or write them write them in such a way that they will interest the readers. I think that's easier. Picture books are are very difficult to write, and I've written quite a number of them. But I I think they're really tricky because you have to say a lot in a very small, small space. Excuse me, <clears throat> and I think that's tricky. So when I write those, I often pare down and pare down with the help of editors because the editor is really important. Uh, novels are a completely different animal. I, I you know. It, I've gravitated to different things at, at different times. Lately, I've been writing a lot of nonfiction manuscripts because I'm just interested in, in, a, in a lot of stuff uh, at, at this point. But at different times of my life, I've written a variety of things. Uh, so it really, it changes a lot. I would say that at this point, to work on another novel, I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> I just, I'm, I'm tired. <laughs> So I, I like writing, I mean, I like writing the nonfiction. I like, re, I like research a lot. I really, really, really enjoy researching things um, because it teaches me stuff. I find out things. Um, I like making up stories out of my own head, but I tend to go back and forth when I get tired of my own head. That's when I like to research things. And you're, you're nodding. I think you agree with this, you know? Yep. It's like, that's it. I want to just read stuff that's out there and then I'll turn it into something. And does that answer your question, Chris? Yes, it, it does beautifully, but it opens up an interesting door because picture books are such an interesting creation because they're they're collaborative all the way through. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious in terms of research and also design, Ed, when you're showing us the, the sketches, um, I love seeing sketches because I noticed that all of yours had you've marked off the gutter, which is the place in the book where things come together. How do you work around those limitations of knowing where things are going to disappear into the book? How does, how does visual placement work for research? 
Um, well, it has, I don't know how much it has to do with research. It's more about composition of the picture and placement of things. Um, and so, yeah, the gutter's important. The gutter is basically a canyon of death. It's where things <laughs> disappear. <laughs> I mean, you can't get close to that thing. You know, there's this like safety zone of about, I don't know, a centimeter on either side of it. Sorry, Australian. So I'm going to use the metric system. <laughs> Half an inch. How about that? Um, on either side where that's, that's the safe zone where things will not fall into the gutter. And, um, you know, it's the beauty of the codex format, though. That page turn is so important. You cannot get it any other way. It's, it's amazing. And actually, and, and that design thing, like, so I was interested, okay, like back to the design, there's two elements. I mean, there's lots of elements. There's your borders of the spread. There's the gutter, the death zone. The borders are also like, can be tr tricky because they're trimmed. And if you've got anything too close, it can just get chopped off. So you've got to be wary of that. Then the really important thing is how much text exists on the page. So you can either, you know, you can set text lots of different ways. I tend to design my layouts so that the text exists with the picture as opposed to separately from the picture. Um, so I will sort of create in the composition sort of dead areas or, you know, like an area of sky or something that a, a, a text block can live on. Um, so that's a, that's, a, that's a huge part of what I do is designing, you know, trying to get the information into that space that is also has a big text block living in it. Like, and that's that's the thing with with uh, nonfiction for this age of reader. There's there are more words than a general picture book. A, a, a picture book for younger readers is usually under five hundred words. Marilyn's would have been around a thousand words, I would think. Is that about right? I it, didn't count, but probably yeah. You yeah, know, and I, so, we knew this was older, so. Yeah. Right. So the text blocks are bigger. It's just it's just something you have to grapple with. So I don't know. I, that's 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 what I'm thinking about all the time. Is like, okay, I've got I've got these things I need to put in there. Like if it's a cityscape, if it's a character, if it's a bird flying, if it's any of these things, and I'm like, where is the type going to live? Or I, can I split the type apart? Can I or can I put a bunch of spots in there and have the type live in white space? Those are all concerns, but it's all based on the information. Like sometimes, a a, a, so you, the first thing you do is you paginate it, the, the book, which be, means splitting apart the stanzas into pages. And I, that can be done by the editor. It can be done by me. We can do it together. It's based on sort of, it's usually pretty obvious actually where things visually split apart. But then some some pieces of writing, uh, like some stanzas or some paragraphs will have like sometimes they'll just have, say, three or four different elements within the, that single paragraph. And that's a point at which I might consider making four different spot illustrations that refer to those elements. And then then the type can be set in the white space because the spots just exist as vignettes. And then I have full page spreads and then I have to make dead areas where the type block lives. And then I might have a single page that, that is full bleed and then a spot on the other page. And then the type might exist below the spot. There, there are all these different light layouts that you can do and it's, you want it to progress. So the people want to pay, like turn the page. I could, I, I could listen to this for hours. I can see your, I can see the instructor coming out. We, I want to be mindful of, of our uh, home viewers' time. But no, 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 you're no, it's it's we we've covered too much. I, we can keep going. I do have one last question for both of you, though. We work very closely at the library with people who want to get into writing and illustrating through the Society of Children's Book Writers and Illustrators. Um, is there a piece of advice that you would give to someone who wants to get into this profession? <laughs> Don't. 
<laughs> we're both like, don't do it. No. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Oh my god! Um, I mean, I don't, I don't know what it's like for writers, but I, I know as, I mean, I, my personal story is, a, it's a little odd, I think. I mean, I didn't, I didn't look to do children's books. The first book I did was called What to Do About Alice, and I got a phone call, luckily. But it, that phone call had been preceded by years of being a general editorial illustrator doing work for places like the New Yorker and, you know, various ad campaigns and record covers and all this stuff that you do as a freelance illustrator. And basically, I think for me, it was just being at large in the world of illustration that, that got me, gave me the opportunity to do my first children's book. And then I just kept going. So that was, that's my story, but I, I don't think that's normal. I think some people just, they really want to do children's books. And I don't know what the answer is as an illustrator of how to really go about that besides sending your work to editors, art directors, creative directors at publishing firms. Don't talk to other illustrators. We cannot give you work. Like we don't make those decisions, <laughs> but it's like send your work out, you know, look at LinkedIn, see where people work, send them your work. That's, that's what I know of. That's how it, that's how you do it. That's great. That's great. Yeah. Marilyn, I'm putting you on the hot chair. Give, give me some good advice. Well, you know, when I started out, things were a lot different. Uh, this was in the 70s. And you could send your work out to a lot of people. Now, most publishers want you to have an agent. Some don't. But a lot of editors uh, go to conferences and speak at conferences. And at the at these conferences, you um, don't you're encouraged to to send your work to the editor. You don't necessarily have to have an agent. But so one of the things I tell people is you really need to go to conferences. Now that's tricky right now because of COVID. Uh, but there are online conferences, and presumably there'll be in person ones. So that's one thing. SCBWI is very helpful in terms of uh, of advice. Um, the Children's Book Council has a members list, which tell uh, it tells you which publishers uh, require that you have an agent or you've already been published. There's some that don't require you to have an agent. You can just send things in over the transom. Um, so those are things that I think are good. But in terms of the of writing itself, um, I always tell people the same exact thing, and that is to walk around, to listen in on conversations, to use all of your senses, to uh, have a sense of, of wonder about things. I think that's really important to, um, to read a lot. Uh, and uh, that's, that's basically it. Just uh, don't try to pigeonhole yourself too much and say, uh, I'm gonna write this because this is the only thing that's selling right now because that changes all the time. So you're, it sounds corny, but you really do have to write what you're interested in. Uh, and, but you also have to know that it, it may not sell and, or it may sell at another time or, you know, whatever. But, but I think it's important to just do what, you know, really, really focus on what interests you a lot. Writing is different, I think, from, uh, illustration and that uh, someone can call you up and say, would you like to illustrate a book about this? It happens occasionally in writing where someone has asked me, would you, would you write a book about this? Um, one example is I was asked to write a book of poems about all of the presidents. And my first response was, no way in hell. I don't, you know, I don't know anything about these people. And I can't do that. And then what happened was I got crazy and I wrote eight poems and <laughs> I went, oh, I think maybe I can do this. So sometimes people will ask you to do something, but most of the time that isn't what happens. So it really has to be what, you know, what interests you and what, what you want to focus on. You both have inspired one last question uh, from online. I'm going to, it's from an anonymous attendee who wants to know, do you have a dream project? And unfortunately we have to end it with questions uh, there, but it's a great place to end. A dream project that we're working on, a dream project that we would like to work on. Something or... you haven't done yet, but I'll, I'll open it up to, to either. <laughs> Something I haven't done yet. 
oh my god i don't i'm blanking out on that i mean i there's something that i that i did which i would love to you know somebody to there's a lot of stuff that i've done that i wish somebody would pick up on one day but i mentioned this earlier um i i did a book on I had a pet starling years ago. It is legal to keep starlings, so uh, <laughs> they're, they're not indigenous. So I had a pet starling and it was a fascinating bird and I ended up doing a, um, a manuscript on how starlings got to the United States. And uh, it was a crazy guy who wanted to have all of the birds that were mentioned in Shakespeare mm -hmm. in the United States. And I, I, I've done several versions of that manuscript and I would love, you know, somebody to 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 accept that because i just think it's an, a really interesting story uh in terms of something i wish i knew how to write but i don't i would love to know how to write a play i've never written one i don't know how to write one i go to the theater a lot uh, and i think that would be just interesting but i so it's a it's a dream that will probably never come true but it it does interest me how do you write a play i i don't know you know that so that's my answer ed take it away <laughs> okay my answer is a bit of a cop out but it's true my dream project is the next one that i get <laughs> honestly i just want people to keep calling me and giving me projects that that's my dream <laughs> i think that's a great answer that's a fa that's a fantastic way to to end it we've, we've learned so much today i have adapted canyon of death into my vocabulary to describe gutters which i'm doing from now on uh special thanks to joe shemtov at the rare book department marilyn singer uh the author and special gold star to ed for getting up uh in the middle of the darkness we can see behind you that the sun is just starting to oh to crest in seattle so <laughs> thank you all very much and uh we hope to see you again at the free library soon thank you thank you <laughs> <laughs>